Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, it's great to be back in Appleton, one of our favorite places of all the places I've been. I've done over 500 conferences and missions over the years. And uh, Appleton uh, ranks at the, at the very top in, uh, in terms of the response that we've gotten over the years. And so we're very happy to be here. We're going to do uh, a new series, uh, so you're going to become famous. You'll be on television. Uh, it's going to be an interesting topic, I think. We'll see how it comes out. Something I haven't done before, the topic is familiar to me, but I haven't ex done exactly this uh, before. It's uh, 21st century spiritual survival based on a few books I have here. One's the Bible. One is Field Manual 21-76, the United States Army Survival Manual. <laughs> and the other one, the Special Forces Handbook. You know, Jesus used parables uh, analogies, metaphors uh, to teach. He took examples from the natural order to point us to things above nature. And uh, that's a, a very good way to teach because people understand it. So we're going to, we're going to do that. We're going to take examples uh, that we can understand from the natural order, uh, everyday life, in, in this case, uh, survival. And if you think survival today, spiritual survival, moral survival, if you think that's not a relevant topic, uh, well, just tune in the 6 o'clock news tonight, and you may become convinced. Uh, these are not ordinary times. These are extraordinary times. And survival is something you better think about for yourself, your family, your friends. You know, the military talks about survival in a physical sense, surviving uh, when you're behind enemy lines, faced with hostile forces. Well, let me clue you in. You are behind enemy lines, whether you know it or not, whether you believe it or not, whether you like it or not, you are behind enemy lines. And you have to know how to survive in that kind of a situation. This is a hostile environment for religion, for virtue, for the practice of our faith. Oh, it may not be hostile in the sense of uh, outright uh, physical persecution, but if you stand fast in your faith today publicly, if you speak your mind, if you don't buckle at the knees, get weak in the spine, and wimp out, you'll be persecuted. The world will let you know that your views are antiquated, not wanted. Now, you're in a hostile environment, all right, and you've got to know how to survive. And so we're going to present Four talks on uh, spiritual survival in the 21st century. And as I said, we'll use analogies uh, from the natural order. And uh, someone asked me, uh, they always ask me, what are, the, um, what are the titles of the talks, you know, for advertising and so forth. So uh, they're very creative this time. Uh, it's called Spiritual Survival Part One. Spiritual survival part two, part three, and part four. Uh, later, after you and I both find out what's going to be in those talks, we might be able to name them with something more descriptive. Um, I, I basically know what I'm going to say when, when I do this, but not totally. 
You know, I don't uh, write it out and read it. Uh, I have some notes. I have a framework. I know roughly what I want to cover. But exactly how that comes out, I don't know that. You know, the Holy Spirit knows that. And, uh, you know, I, I show up. You showed up. And we better hope the Holy Spirit shows up. <laughs> because if he doesn't, we're both in big trouble. But I know he will because he always does. This four-part presentation, I hope, will equip you, help to equip you, to fight the good fight and run the race to the finish line. Uh, just like when you're in the military. You know, in the military, you get sent on a mission. You know, your mission might be gather intelligence, take out the bridge, do this, do that. You have a mission. Our mission is very clear. We don't have to guess about that. Our mission is the mission of the Redeemer. Jesus, the Redeemer. What is the mission of the Redeemer? Redemption. Imagine that. The servant, that's us, is no better than his master. What's our mission? Redemption. The salvation of souls. Yes, you have to save your soul, but not only your soul. Every one of us shares in our baptism, we share in the mission of Christ, which is redemption. So we're sent on a mission in a hostile environment. The world, the prince of this world, Jesus calls him. He's the prince of this world. This world, that's the battlefield. The prince of this world, the devil. Now, I, I don't have time because I always have limited time. You know, I, I, I come in, I, I do what I've got to do, in a few hours I get out. I don't have time uh, to uh, argue about things the Catholic Church formally teaches. Uh, there are people um, in the Catholic Church even who... Uh, they don't really understand or they don't accept what the church teaches. One thing when, when, when the hostile forces on the outside don't accept it, well, sure, we understand that. We, we expect that. But sometimes when there's subversion from within, that's the problem. But you know, don't be scandalized and don't be shocked if and when that happens. Uh, it's not if, it's just when. It has happened. It will happen. Don't be taken back by that. We are too easily shocked. We are too easily scandalized. You know, a fighter who's back on his heels all the time gets knocked out. Do not be constantly back on your heels, reeling because of, oh, how could that have happened? Grow up. You know, some bishops asked me one time, well, how can we make sure the scandals, things like that, never happen again? I said, ordain aardvarks. <laughs> or frogs, moose, bears, rabbits, anything but men. There is no way to absolutely guarantee that sin won't happen. Why? Because everybody's a sinner. So grow up, get over it, and be a good soldier. Don't be so easily scandalized because it doesn't do us any good. One of the problems we have, and here's an analogy that I, I told you about, we take from the natural order and apply it to higher things. A fighter who's going backwards constantly, he's on his heels, he's afraid of the other guy, he gets knocked out. When you are nothing but defensive, reeling, going backwards, you get knocked on your butt. And that's the way we've been in many cases, too defensive, not offensive enough. I don't mean offensive, like in, you know, an offensive person. I mean on the offense, you know?
The scandals were a horrible thing. We all regret that. It's awful. It happened. Some of our brothers did terrible things. We know that. We don't, you can't deny it. It happened. Uh, what they don't tell you is those things were ten times more common in certain other professions. They don't tell you that because it doesn't make headlines. It's not good news. But when a priest does it, and it's bad, I'm not minimizing it, it's terrible. But they capitalize upon that because there's an inherent hatred for religion in the Western world now. There is an inherent hatred. If you don't believe that, you haven't been where I've been. If you think you're normal, you're crazy. <laughs> you're not normal. You are a remnant. Gideon's army. On a relative basis, there aren't many of us. <clears throat> you know, they, they, they talk about, well, how many members do we have in the Catholic Church, uh, say, in the United States? And, you know, you hear the, the figure 60 million, 70 million, baloney. Those are nominal. You know, you might put it on the census report or something, your religion, Catholic. But if you haven't been to Mass for 30 years, you don't receive the sacraments, you don't believe what the church believes, you're not Catholic, in fact. And so, what's my guess? About 10% of that. Maybe 6 million. And the special forces troops, the elite forces, about 10% of that. The ones who pray the rosary every day, who go to adoration, who practice virtue when it isn't easy to practice virtue. Not that many on a relative basis. And so, you're elite troops, but you have to be trained. One of the most dangerous traps a person can fall in is the denial of reality. Uh, that, that's one of the most... Um, self-defeating things that you can engage in to deny reality. And, and here's what I mean by that. You know, let, let's say uh, you have a special forces unit uh, in, in Afghanistan, and uh, one of the men, you know, he's about to go on a mission. Uh, well, you've got to go and, and, and do reconnaissance on this village to see if there's enemy activity. And he says, well, what for? There's no enemy. There's no war. Everybody is warm and fuzzy. They all love me. They don't want to hurt me. Are you goofy? <laughs> what would I do with a man like that if I was his commanding officer? I, I'd, I'd remove him and, and put him in a padded place where he couldn't hurt himself or anybody else. Because if I put him next to my guys who are in harm's way and he doesn't acknowledge basic reality, he's not only a threat to himself, he's a threat to the guy on his left and his right. It is no different for you and me. We are at war. And our battle is not against flesh and blood. Let me read to you uh, from a passage that I've read a zillion times from St. Paul's letter to the Ephesians. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. Why would you put on armor if you're not in a battle? Well, you wouldn't. Put on the whole armor of God. Doesn't say put on some of the armor of God. Doesn't say put on 50% of the armor of God. Doesn't say put on most of the armor of God. It says put on the whole armor of God. What happens if you don't put on the whole armor of God? Well, you're not protected completely. The devil's a good shot. He'll take you out. He will take you out. So put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. Now, I started to say before, 
I don't have time to fiddle around arguing with people who don't believe what the Catholic Church believes. If some upstart theolo theologian who, who just doesn't understand the faith tells you the devil doesn't exist, smile sweetly at him and uh, walk away because he's, he doesn't know his faith. I don't care how many degrees he has. All kinds of people have been educated into imbecility. So it, it doesn't make a bit of difference. I, I'm all for education. I, I, I believe in education. I have five university degrees. I paid my dues. I earned most of them with highest honors. So I, I, I know what the church teaches. There's good and evil. There's grace and sin. There's God and the enemy of God. We are at war, and St. Paul says, put on the whole armor of God that you may stand against the wiles of the devil. And he is a wily adversary. The very word Satan means the adversary. For we are not contending against flesh and blood. We're in hostile territory, but human beings are not the real enemy. But against principalities and powers... Those are choirs of angels. In this case, fallen angels, the demonic forces. There's no debate about that. I, I've had persons inside the church say, oh, I don't believe in the devil. Well, why would you brag about being a heretic? <laughs> in plain English, you don't believe what the church believes. You know, they don't, we don't like to use those harsh terms anymore. We're too civilized. Yeah, we're too detached from reality is what we are. What is heresy? It's an obstinate, now note all the words. They're important. Heresy is an obstinate, note the word obstinate, an obstinate post-baptismal denial of some element of faith or morals which must be believed, which must be believed with divine and Catholic faith, or an obstinate doubt, note the words, obstinate doubt. So you, either it's a denial or a doubt, even a doubt, concerning, concerning some element, element of faith or morals which must be accepted. Listen, there isn't anything in the Bible that says without understanding it is impossible to please God. What it says in there is without faith, it is impossible to please God. We walk by faith, not by sight. That's the word of God. What does that mean? It means we accept the church's teaching in faith and morals on faith. Faith. But I don't understand it. You don't have to. As a matter of fact, you can't. You only think you can but but I, I'll believe that some people, somebody said to me once, if you could fully explain the Trinity to me, I'll, I'll become Catholic. I said, brother, if I could fully explain the Trinity to you, I'd be God and you could worship me. <laughs> I would have to be God to explain God. Who can fathom God? God is infinite. By definition, right? God is infinite. God has given us a mind, an intelligence, and we should use it. However, our mind is finite. We're, we're creatures. By definition, we're finite. So a finite mind can't fully comprehend the infinite God. That's an exercise in futility. You're doomed to failure. That does not mean that faith and reason are opposed. They are not. They are perfectly consistent. However, it is by faith that we walk. We proceed by faith. So when the church teaches something in faith and morals, our business is to accept it. Now, you have to know what that is. Part of your preparation, you know, if you're going to go into battle, 
Soldiers have to be prepared. If you do not know the basics of your Catholic and Christian faith, you're unprepared. You are ill-prepared to meet a very, very wily adversary. And you're going to lose. Now, what, what we're concerned about here, yes, we're on a mission. We're in hostile territory. The mission's redemption. Hostile territory is the world under the control of the prince of this world, as Jesus called him. He's a liar and the father of lies, a murderer from the beginning. So you have to know the nature of the enemy. If you're going to be a good soldier and fight the good fight, if you're going to survive in hostile territory, you must know the nature of the enemy. Well, let's see what else St. Paul has to say. Well, we're fighting against world rulers of the present age of darkness, against the spiritual hosts of wickedness in regions above. Therefore, take the whole armor of God, once again, the whole armor of God. Don't leave something out, part of that armor. Well, the doctrine of the faith, the moral teaching of the church. You know, somebody says, well, I accept all, all the Ten Commandments, except one. <laughs> then what you do is you, you leave part of yourself unguarded, unprotected. And the devil will put an arrow right through the unprotected part. That is where you will be wounded. And he said, well, uh, I, I, I think that I accept all the church's teaching except the teaching on abortion. Listen, in case you haven't heard it, and I know you have, but it, and, and some of you have you've heard it from me for years, but you cannot be pro-choice and Catholic. Forget it. Ain't happening. You cannot say that you are a good Catholic or any kind of a Catholic other than a dead Catholic. You're a dead soldier. You got a dead soldier laying out on the battlefield. <clears throat> What's he going to do? Is he going to take the bridge? Is he going to gather intelligence for you? Is he going to fight the good fight? No, he's dead. When you reject essential church teaching, and that's a big one, that's teaching on the fifth commandment, no one in their right mind, no one in their right mind could ever say that abortion is acceptable, not even under certain circumstances. Well, what about in cases of rape? Well, rape is a horrible thing. God help us. It's terrible. But will it be rectified by murder? No. Once the life is conceived, it is. God is the author of life. God decides when you begin to live and when you die. Once we start playing God, we're ill-equipped. Do not be confused about that. Don't let the enemy engage in psychological warfare against you. Psyops, they call it in the military. Don't allow the enemy to mess with your mind. If the devil takes your mind, you're dead meat. If you begin to think like him, he's won you over. Then it's arguable that you're on that, the other side. You're not part of the solution. You become part of the problem. I'll say it one more time in case there's any doubt, and I know there's not among you good people, but just so you're totally confirmed in it, and when you go back out there, which you're going to have to do, you're 100% confirmed in this. It is absolutely, unquestionably, irrefutably impossible to be pro-choice and Catholic. You can't do it. And if anybody else tells you different, especially inside the church or does anything to encourage that pro-death mentality, know what you're dealing with. Don't be deterred. Don't be weak in the knees, soft in the spine. Be soft-hearted, not soft-headed. There's a difference.
be compassionate. And I'm compassionate to all human weakness. I feel very sorry for, for people who get in a bad spot. But encouraging them to participate in what is tantamount to murder is not the solution to any problem. So be strong in that. We're contending against, remember this, the enemy is the devil. The enemy is the devil. St. Paul's clear. Our battle's not against flesh and blood. It, 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 it seems like it sometimes. And, and yes, human beings do end up being pawns in the battle. You know, they do the devil's bidding. But, but they've been captured. And what do we have to do? What did Jesus come to do? He came to set the captives free. You know what the special forces motto is? It's in Latin. De oppresso liber. To free the oppressed. Hmm, kind of similar there. Jesus, special forces. To set the captives free. That's why he came. Special forces motto, to free the oppressed. See, we, we, we have that mission. <clears throat> so when you see someone, whether it's the lowest person, a street person, unemployed, on, on drugs, <clears throat> homeless, helpless, whether you see him and he's living a bad life, <clears throat> all the way up to the President of the United States, anybody, and you, you see that they're not living, or thinking, or acting in a way consistent with objective truth and goodness, don't take them as the enemy. Our battle's not against flesh and blood. Our battle is against spiritual forces. You have to know these things. This is basic. Don't be sidetracked. All right. Therefore, take the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all that, to stand. Now, I'm going to point something out to you. The word, the verb stand here is used several times in succession. I'll use another analogy now. Uh, St. Paul's talking about uh, spiritual warfare here. He's talking about spiritual survival here, fighting the good fight. <clears throat> you can't stand unless you have a spine in the natural order. You are not going to physically stand if you have no spine. And you're not going to morally and spiritually stand up straight unless you have a spine. You better have a moral backbone. You better have a spiritual spine or you can't stand. You'll fall. Why has the United States of America and every other Western country fallen from prominence? Why have we begin, be, we've begun to lose our standing in the world? Why? The moral demise of a nation always precedes the ultimate demise of a nation. Read history if you don't believe it. The moral unraveling of a nation, and I submit to you that's what we have today, the moral unraveling of a nation leads to the ultimate unraveling of the nation. You don't believe it, read the headlines. Look what's happening economically. It's a disaster. And it will get worse. Oh, how can you say that? I've been saying it for 20 years. And I have not been wrong. It has gone from bad to worse and yet will get worse. The disaster in the Gulf. Do you have any idea how bad that really is? It's an unprecedented disaster. 
nothing will go right until we're right with God. Nothing will go right until we're right with God. We will become weaker and weaker and weaker economically, militarily, socially, in every way conceivable. And upstart, pipsqueak countries, rogue nations like North Korea and Iran will spit in our eye. They know we don't have the money or the will to sustain a conflict. Our position is getting weaker and weaker and weaker because our moral and spiritual life, one person at a time, has gotten weaker and weaker and weaker. And the ultimate end of that weakness is defeat. The vaporization of freedom, of our way of life. Survival is relevant. At a certain point in time, survival becomes the only thing. It's not going to make a bit of difference what kind of car you drive, how big your house is, what your job is, your salary, your benefits. Doesn't mean a thing. It pales into utter insignificance when cast in the pure light of reality. Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you continue in my word, you are truly my disciples, then you will know the truth. And the truth will make you free. Jesus came to set the captives free. Let me read to you the special forces prayer. Yeah, imagine that. The special forces has a prayer. Let me tell you something. <laughs> if you're in some of the places they are, you'd be praying. See, it's right on the spe Special Forces Handbook. See that? Right on the back of it, Special Forces Prayer. Wow, in the United States of America, where God's been evicted from the public sphere, where the author of existence has been thrown out, where you don't want, you can't mention God in public places, the Ten Commandments, you can't say a prayer in a public prayer. Well, Special Forces, they have a prayer. Almighty God, who art the author of liberty, freedom and the champion of the oppressed now I want you to remember put yourself in here you are one of God's special operations soldiers this is your prayer all you have to do is adjust it for spiritual things almighty God still the same God that we're praying to only one God you are the author of liberty and the champion of the oppressed. Who's the oppressed? Every one of us. Every one of us that's caught in the battlefield of life that has to fight the good fight and is in danger. You know, the church says that the story of human existence is the account of combat, dour combat they call it, dour combat with the forces of evil. That's right out of the Catechism of the Catholic Church, which quotes another major document in church history. The story of human existence is the account of dour combat with the forces of evil. I didn't make that up, folks. That's the church's admonition, the church's assertion. We, the men and women of the special forces, acknowledge our dependence upon thee, O Lord, in the preservation of human freedom. Now remember, just when you're thinking, just translate this from the physical order of warfare to the spiritual, because it's the same. The analogy works. Go with us, O Lord, as we seek to defend the defenseless and to free the enslaved. May we ever remember that our nation, all of humanity, whose motto is 
in God we trust, expects that we shall acquit ourselves with honor and that we may never bring shame upon our faith, our families, or our fellow men. Grant us wisdom from thy mind, courage from thy heart, strength from thine arm, and protection by thy divine hand. It is for thee that we do battle, O Lord, and to thee belongs the victor's crown, for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. That is the Special Forces Prayer. That's the prayer of the United States Army Special Forces. It's a pretty good prayer. We are at war. Our battle, not against flesh and blood. If you don't believe that, you are in a perilous place. You are behind enemy lines with no belief that the enemy exists. What will happen is that the enemy will take you out without resistance. You have a mission. I have a mission. The mission is redemption, the same mission as Jesus, the Redeemer. Don't deny reality. There is a battle. There is good, there is evil, there is truth, there are lies. There's life and there is death, therefore choose life. Go the right way, fight the good fight. Don't deny these realities. Life really is a war. What I'm going to do in the second talk is I'm going to go into the acronym that the Army uses for survival. You know, an acronym where you take the word survival and then you take the letters in that word, like S, first letter in the word survival, and then you, you have a reality and they go through all that to help you remember how to survive. And I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to take that word survival and then I'm going to translate it into spiritual survival and what you have to do in order to survive. But th th there's some basic things. I'm not reinventing the wheel here. You, you may not have heard anybody else quite do it this way, but that's okay. Sometimes you have to hear things or see things from uh, multiple perspectives in order to gain full perspective on that reality. So I'm trying to present this to you in a way that's easily understandable. You know, if I got up here and talked in fancy theological terms and sounded eloquent and wonderful, you might say, oh, doesn't Father speak wonderfully? And then, and then um, you know, some old farmer would say, yeah, well, what did he say? <laughs> and, and it doesn't do you any good unless you understand what I'm talking about. And that's what I've always tried to do. A teacher is useless if they cannot convey to every student what it is they're trying to convey. You know, if you obscure the message with incomprehensible language and presentation, you're not a good teacher. Uh, a, a teacher's job is to convey the material to the students in an uncluttered manner. Uh, you you want to convey it intelligibly. Let me tell you who doesn't do that. Something I've seen in the church in, in the last 25 years that I've been pretty active uh, in the church. They will take pure intelligibility. That's God by definition. God is pure light. God is truth itself. And some of these so-called teachers, theologians, whatever, they will take pure intelligibility, God, the doctrine of the faith, and they will nuance it into utter ambiguity. I'll say that again. Here's what a bad teacher does. Here's what an anti-teacher does. Takes pure intelligibility and nuances it twists it, torques it, distorts it into utter ambiguity so that you don't have a clue what he's talking about. You know, you can do that with the sacraments. 
what is a sacrament? And then you, they, they give some exa an explanation. You sit there and you have a dull headache when it's over. <laughs> Your vision is clouded. You wish you were someplace else. And you don't know any more at the end than you did at the beginning. Not a good teacher. But if the teacher gives you that reality in a simple way that's intelligible, that the light bulb goes on and you say, aha! So that's what a, whatever it is, you know, sacrament. What's a sacrament? A sense perceptible sign which effects what it signifies. And then a little bit of explanation. And it's easy, you've got it. Grace, sanctifying grace, what's that? A share in divine life. Wow, rocket science. Well, it's a, it's, it is a high, it's a very high truth. But you have to be able to take those very high truths and present them in an intelligible fashion. You do not do the troops any good. You don't do your children any good, your grandchildren, your friends. You don't do them any good unless they can understand what you're talking about. Now, that's why very often the most eloquent sermon is an action. Um, a picture worth a thousand words, that same, right? There was a British journalist, Malcolm Muggeridge, who, who had struggled intellectually with the faith for some time studied the Catholic faith, couldn't quite come to it. One day he met Mother Teresa. The light bulb went on. So that's what a Catholic is. He became Catholic. See, that, that's an example of what you have to do. But if you don't even know what it means to be Catholic, and a lot of Catholics don't have a clue, by the way, I think you do, but, but a lot of them don't, how are we going to convey that to them? Well, the best way we can, by our example. Uh, by words, too, but by our example. So life is a war. There's some basic things that you have to know for survival. You know, in the military, uh, they have survival courses. They, they, they'll send you to a the survival school. Pilots all get survival training. There are basic things you have to know in order to survive in a physical war and in a spiritual war. And if you ignore these things, you ignore them to your own peril. Now, there are a lot of people who don't like to think this way because it's uncomfortable. And I, and I admit that everyone uh, has value in the church. Uh, some people uh, are, are more adept at talking about warm, fuzzy things. I'm not good at warm, fuzzy things. <laughs> Therefore, I don't do warm, fuzzy. I do cold, hard reality. You know, foot to butt. <laughs> you know, it, it's basic. It's very, very basic. Okay. Four things we're going to come back to over and over and over and over again. What we believe. Now, what I'm giving you here is the basic structure of the catechism of the Catholic Church. Now, I, I, I know you know this, but I have to say it. Every one of you should certainly have a Bible. I know you have a Bible. And that, first and foremost. But if you don't understand what it says, if you can quote chapter and verse incessantly but don't have a clue to what it means, it's of limited value. The Catechism of the Catholic Church is a gift that we have in the Catholic Church that helps us understand divine revelation. That's part of your survival training. You know, in the natural order, if a soldier is caught behind enemy lines in a hostile environment, you know, he could be caught in the desert in Iraq. He, he could be caught out in the arid mountains of Afghanistan. He could be caught in the jungles of, of Vietnam. As, as some were in my lifetime. You have to know something about that environment. And they teach you this in survival school. 
You, you've got to know something about the environment in which we operate. You have to know something about that environment, which is a hostile environment. We're caught behind enemy lines, in a manner of speaking. You must know the nature of the environment, the nature of the enemy, in order to survive. And that's what we're going to do here. So you got to know what we believe. Creed. You have to know. That's the first section of the catechism. You've got to know what we believe in the Catholic Church. How are you going to know it if you, or live it if you don't know it? And I submit to you that a vast number of Catholics don't know their faith. I know this for a fact. When I started, right after I was ordained, even before I was ordained, when I was a deacon, whenever I would uh, do a parish mission or talk to people, at the end, I gave them a simple, very simple catechetical test. I mean, I, I typed it out, ran off copies, had the ushers lock the doors, <laughs> and nobody got out until they took the test. Then I collected up the paper. Now, now let me tell you something. If, if you're a teacher and if you're involved with education and if you think you can assess whether or not your students have gotten the material and understand it without testing them, your brain isn't working properly. There's only one way to find out if they know the material. You must test them. Well, so if I gave a simple 10-question quiz, which I did for years, at the end of every mission, conference, sim I'm, and no trick questions. What are the Ten Commandments? You know, we could do it right now. I'll just lo look around here for a guilty face. <laughs> you thought it was good sitting in the front, huh? <laughs> I can see you. Well, if I said, okay, what are the Ten Commandments? And you say, oh, well, um, do I have to get them in order? <laughs> yeah. What are the seven sacraments? What is a sacrament? What are the seven petitions of the Our Father? Give a brief explanation. What is sanctifying grace? What is an angel? Describe or define purgatory. These are simple questions that I would expect any child preparing for First Holy Communion would know this. What are the seven sacraments? You know, a seven-year-old child in the Catholic Church they ought to know that. Now, unlike what I found that after 12 years of education in the Catholic school, more than half of them didn't have a clue. You say, how'd that happen? <laughs> Your guess is as good as mine. They weren't taught. Just like in mathematics, if you're teaching, you know, fifth grade math, you, you have to have a body of knowledge you're responsible for, right? The teacher, it would be unfair to the teacher to say, oh, well, just teach whatever you want. No, you're responsible to teach this knowledge. And how do you know at the end if the teacher was good and, and if the students... Well, I'll tell you how, how I would know if the teacher's good. The students got it. The lowest... The, the kid with the most difficult time understanding, if he got it, that teacher's pretty good. That teacher did the job. Conveyed that truth to the kid. So... You've got to learn the basics. You have to learn what the church believes. You know, if, if a, somebody of another, uh, from another faith asks you, well, what does the Catholic Church believe about this and this and this, and your best answer is, duh. <laughs> that doesn't do as much good. Two, the sacraments. What is a sacrament? What do they do? What are the seven sacraments? What are the sacraments of initiation? What are the sacraments of healing? What are the sacraments of service? Boom, boom, boom. You should get it. Because at some point, your survival might depend on it. 
You know, training comes back to you. You want to be able to act reflexively in a tough spot. You're caught behind enemy lines. You're injured. They're hunting you like an animal. Will you panic or will you survive? The Ten Commandments, you've got to know that, what they mean. And prayer, the four parts of the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Creed, commandments, sacraments, prayer. That's basically how the, the, the church divides her teaching, those four major categories. You have to have the knowledge. You have to have survival knowledge. That's not everything. But you have to have the knowledge to have a fighting chance. You have to acknowledge spiritual reality. Then I want you to think, if you were, say, caught in the mountains of Afghanistan, you're alone, behind enemy lines. Say uh, your plane went down, you're a pilot. How will you survive? Uh, one of the, I'm going to talk later on this afternoon about unconventional warfare and apply it to the situation we have today in the world. One of the elements of unconventional warfare, of guerrilla warfare, is escape and evasion. You're caught behind enemy lines. You've got to survive. You've got to know how to escape or, or evade, evade capture, evade the enemy. I remember one of my spiritual directors once when I was first starting out. And uh, he, uh, <laughs> he said to me, I want you to become so little the devil can't see you. <laughs> Evasion. That's humility. Become so little the devil can't see you anymore. And if he can't see you, he can't catch you. Evasion. Evade the enemy. You're caught behind enemy lines. He's hunting you. You got no evasion. Escape and evasion. It's essential. We'll talk about that some more. In the next couple of uh, presentations, I'm going to present the, the, the acronym that we use, uh, that the military uses, and that I'm going to apply to this spiritual survival course. Take the letters, S-U-R-V-I-V-A-L, survival. S, size up the situation. Size up the situation. Know where you are. Are you injured? You know, your, your plane goes down, your, 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 your unit is caught behind enemy lines. Assess the situation. Size up the situation. You. Undo haste makes waste. Hmm, I wonder what that could mean for spiritual survival. Have you ever noticed that people run like crazy people today? Frenetic activity, rapid succession of sounds and sights, television, thousands of images in rapid succession. They speed up your brain. It's hard to pray. You can't settle down. Undo haste makes waste. You are. Remember where you are. You are caught behind enemy lines. You're on a battlefield. Failure to remember where you are is hazardous to your health, your spiritual health. The vanquish fear and panic. I think sometimes we don't like to think about these things. You know, I think priests sometimes, and I sympathize with, with all priests, they don't want to talk about these things because people don't like it. Well, I, <laughs> I'm sure nobody likes to, to hear in the military about getting captured and what can happen to you if you're captured. But they better hear about it, and they better know about it, and they better act accordingly. Value live or improvise. Improvise. You know, adapt and improvise. Oh, but the, the diocese won't 
teach the catechism or they won't do that. And they, oh, cut it out, man. Do it yourself. <laughs> Improvise. You got a brain? Improvise. Then have it at your home and gather a few people and watch my series on the catechism. <laughs> That's one way to do it, right? All right? B, B, value living. Value living. Have the will to live. A, act like the natives. Who's the natives for our purpose, purposes? The saints. They knew how to do it. L, learn basic survival skills and so forth. We're going to go into these things in more detail. You've got to know how to survive in order to survive. Don't wait until the catastrophe happens to try to learn it then. It's too late. You've got to be able to respond reflexively. Your training kicks in and you survive. You have to do this. A failure to do this, not only do you let yourself down, but you let others down. You know, the, why do we do this? You know, in, in, in the special forces, I have a friend who's a retired general. He's going to be inducted into the Ranger Hall of Fame and the Special Forces Hall of Fame. John Wayne played him in the movie, The Green Berets. He was the commanding officer of Mike Force in Vietnam. For, for the man at my left and my right, why do I do that? Why do I survive? Why do I fight? For those at my left and my right. Because their survival might depend upon my survival. You have a mission. Let's accomplish the mission. God bless you. So we go from the beauty to the beast. <laughs> the beautiful song to the uh, talk about surviving. Not inconsistent, the one helps you to do the other. Well, the first hour we talked about um, the basics of spirit, the reality of spiritual survival. If you don't acknowledge that there's a that there's a challenge, you're not apt to rise to the challenge. If you don't acknowledge that we are at war, you're not up to fight the war. So uh, there's no question we are at war. St. Paul told us that. All the saints have told us that. There, th this is a reality. Some of the physical realities that, you know, we learn a lot from the natural order because there's one creator, God. God created nature. The realities we deal with in nature point towards higher realities. We can learn about spiritual realities. That's why Jesus gave us parables. He used analogies with uh, agriculture, right, because people understood it. Uh, St. Paul used analogies with uh, athletics and the military. So I'm not uh, making up something here that hasn't long ago come before me. So we're going to use these analogies from the natural order and survival in a battle situation to spiritual survival. Uh, if you do not practice these things, you are easy prey. If you don't understand these survival techniques and tactics, um, then the enemy doesn't have much trouble with you. Uh, it'd be real easy to overcome you. Things that you have to know in a survival situation, basics, right? Think about it. You're, you're stranded in the desert, in the Arctic, in the jungle, in the mountains, um, <laughs> in the city. 
You, you have basic things you need in a survival situation. Food, right? You've got to have food. You've got to have water. You've got to have shelter if you're going to survive for any length of time. It may be shelter from the cold. It may be shelter from the heat. Shelter from the elements. Fire. You know, have to know how to build a fire. You have to know how to stay warm. Otherwise, hypothermia sets in. Now, I'm going to take all these things and, and relate them to the spiritual life because they all have application. Navigation. You know, you're lost in the mountains, in the desert, in the jungle. You have to know how to navigate. You have to know where you came from. You have to know where you're going. It's a good idea to be able to pinpoint where you are. A lot of people don't know where they came from, don't know where they're going, and have no clue where they are right now. That's called being lost. You ever notice why a lot of people are lost? They seem like they're lost. Why do they seem that way? Because they are. Right? No clue. And a, a, a related reality is the identity crisis. You've heard that term, right? People have an identity crisis. Well, an identity crisis is, well, I don't know who I am. Why don't you know who you are? Well, you don't know where you came from, you don't know where you're going, and you don't know who you are and what your mission is right now. Navigation. Essential for survival. You have to know how to navigate. In the old days, we had a, a compass and a topographical map. Now you have a GPS. But I learned something about I have four GPSs. I learned something about GPSs, though, after the first one. You have to know how to use it. <laughs> it really helps to know how to use it. Then you can navigate. Same thing with a compass, right? The compass points north. Well, okay. That, that, that gives you some orientation, but uh, if you don't know where you are, uh, and you don't have any relation, you know, well, where, where's, your, where's your headquarters or where's, where are the friendly forces? Um, it's hard to know which direction to go in, you know, the friendly forces may be south. But you don't have a clue where they are, and you don't know where you are now in relation to that. So navigation's important. Know the enemy. You have to know the nature of the enemy. Today, people in general, and even people in the Catholic Church are largely clueless as to the nature of the enemy. I've had priests and theologians to my face deny the existence of Satan and the fallen angels. Heresy. An obstinate post-baptismal denial of some element of faith and morals which must be accepted with divine and Catholic faith, or an obstinate doubt. I doubt there's a devil. Well, you can doubt it all you want. He's going to get you with his pitchfork. Then you won't doubt that. <laughs> or an obstinate doubt, doubt, doubt concerning what you need to believe. And it's not hard to know what you need to believe. You must study the Catechism of the Catholic Church. I started immediately as a deacon, b before I was ordained a deacon. I had the first draft of the Catechism of the Catholic Church because coincidentally, well, that's wrong, providentially, God put the director of religious education for the Archdiocese of New York in the same monastery where I was making my pre-ordination retreat. Monsignor Michael Wren was there. He gave me a copy of the first draft of the catechism in a red crayon. And he said, tell me what you think, because the Vatican was soliciting response from religious education people around the world. So I saw the first draft and every succeeding draft of the catechism. When it came out in Spanish, I, I, began, I began to use it in Spanish to preach and to teach. And then finally it came out in English, I used that. 
I did my series on the Catechism of the Catholic Church, the teaching of Jesus Christ. It remains the only thing of its kind in the world, in the Catholic Church, in scope and depth. It's 48 hours of lectures and question and answer that synthesizes the Catechism of the Catholic Church. To this day, I marvel that, you know, there's, there have been a couple of small uh, courses on that, you know, six, eight hours here and there. But uh, the, the, I, I'm, at least I'm not aware of anything like it in, in video uh, and audio. It's been on EWTN nonstop since 1997. They play episodes 1 through 50, and then they start one again the next week. And so it has been for years. Need to know your faith. You know the enemy? You adapt and improvise. Adapt to the situation. Improvise. The situation is not the same last year as it is this year, 10 years ago as it is today. There are, the essentials may be the same. But, but you find different things swirling around you. When I was growing up, an archbishop, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, could be on national television in the United States of America. You think that could happen today? No. Wrong. He was on national television. There was no cable television. There were three networks back then. He was on one of the major networks, prime time, Sunday night. Same time I'm on, Sunday night. But I'm on cable. And that's not the same. I mean, it's good. We reach millions of people, but we should have made progress. Decades ago, he was reaching more people on national television. Adapt and improvise. You know, we adapted and improvise. You know, Mother Angelica, she adapted. Can't get on national television. Oh, get on cable. She looked into it, didn't know a thing about television or satellites. Called up in the, out of the yellow pages in the phone book under satellites. <laughs> I want a satellite. Who are you? <laughs> you understand what a satellite is? Well, it's a thing you shoot up in the sky. I want one. <laughs> now. Adapt and improvise. Escape and evade. You've got to know how to escape the enemy. You've got to know how to evade being wounded or killed in action. I'll put this up at the top. I've got ten things that I list as kind of a summary here. But up at the top, number one, and this is right out of the Army Survival Manual and I'm going to use it for our survival manual. Number one, the will to survive. That's number one. You have to have the will to live. Time and time and time and time again in survival situations, it's been proven that those who had the will to survive most often did. You have to have that spirit which will not quit in the face of insurmountable odds. You're not going to quit. I did a very well-received conference in Boston a few years back. And Surrender is Not an Option was the title of it. Cardinal O'Malley and uh, the preacher to the papal household, Father Condolomesa, sat right in the first row. Surrender is not an option. Well, surrendering your will to live, your will to survive, that's not an option. <clears throat> Going to hell isn't an option unless you're out of your mind. Denying the existence of hell is not an op option unless you're a heretic or an ostrich burying your head in the sand. Trust me, there is God. And there is the devil. There is good, there is evil, there is truth, and there are lies. There's heaven and there is hell. There is no question about it. That is a doctrinal certainty. 
There is heaven and there is hell. And you decide where you go for all eternity. Now that's survival. That's eternal survival. You survive a few years on the face of the earth, that's, that's good. Physical survival. Why are we here? Well, one reason, really, we're here to get there. That's why we're here. I can still hear Sister Mildred in the third grade. You remember Sister Mildred? I've talked about Sister Mildred before. She was a force to be reckoned with. She was a, about a four foot 11 force. Four foot 11 high and four foot 11 wide. Now that's a force. And you didn't mess with Sister Mildred. She, Sister Mildred didn't walk, she floated. <laughs> Sister would float in the room, and she had eyes everywhere. She saw everything you were doing. And I remember her stopping in front of my desk. She would quiz you. You know, remember before I said you, the only way to know if the students have learned is to test them. In its absolute silliness, to think otherwise. The only way to ascertain if they have acquired the subject matter is to test them. You don't assume. As my high school chemistry teacher, Mr. James Stiles, said the first minute we met him, he was walked into the room and he wrote the word assume on the blackboard. I am Mr. James Stiles. That's number one. Number two, Never assume you make an ASS out of you and me. Never assume. Don't assume they know it. Assume they don't until they prove they know it. You've got to test. So you have to know these things. You have to have the will to live, will to survive, it helps a great deal in a survival situation if you are physically fit. Right? It helps a great deal in a spiritual survival situation if you are spiritually fit. What does that mean? Well, first of all, it means you've got to be in a state of grace. If you are not in a state of grace, you're basically dead. Now, you can be brought back to life. Jesus brought the, the, the dead back to life, right? He raised the dead. So, so he can do it through the power of grace. But if you are in mortal sin, the life of grace in you is dead. By definition, mortal sin extinguishes the life of grace in the soul. Now, that can be resuscitated. We know. Uh, you repent of your sins, being Catholic. You're conscious of serious sin. You go to confession. And the power of sanctifying grace brings you back to life. That's one of the sacraments of, of healing, as we call it. So, you have to be in, in shape to be able to survive. Uh, you know, in the military, we, we had great emphasis on physical training, PT, physical training. Well, for you, it's ST, spiritual training. If you're lazy, you're not going to make it. If you're disinterested, not going to happen. You have to be engaged. You have to be motivated. Motivated people survive. Unmotivated people don't. People who are prepared have a better chance of survival. Don't hope for a miracle in a survival situation. Could it happen? Yes. It's presumption to think it will happen. You must 
be prepared. And if you are not prepared and you have not prepared your family, you are derelict in your duty. You know, you, you, if you do your part and they don't do their part, that's not your fault. You do the best you can, but you've got to be prepared. We're going to go through the acronym. Survival. Those letters, eight letters, S-U-R-V-I-V-A-L, survival. S, size up the situation. Okay, here we are. 21st century, United States of America. Step back, look at where we are, size up the situation so you can know how to react. Well, you could do it like this, maybe, like I do. I'm more than a half a century old, and I look at what things were like when I began, when I was a boy. Well, Bishop Sheen was on television. You know, who else? Bob Hope, Milton Berle, you know, Perry Como, people like that. Yeah, pretty innocent television shows, right? Okay. Uh, I don't know how many television channels I have with, I have Dish Network where I live because I got to check up on EWTN every now and then, <laughs> make sure that my shows are on there. So I've got, I don't know, 150 channels. 150 channels or more, and nothing is on. <laughs> right? Well, that's part of the situation. I look at my country, which when I was a boy was certainly the most powerful country on the face of the earth. Certainly did a lot of good, and despite what some people say, by and large, was a Judeo-Christian culture. That's a fact. Well, look at it today. That we could have arguments that, that you can't pray in school, arguments that you can, the Ten Commandments can't be seen. By the way, I live in northwest Montana, and it's a little bit different there than, than some places. They, they've got big um, plaques of the Ten Commandments everywhere the eye can see. Well, yeah, that, that's good. You, you, but, you, but the Catholic Church didn't do it. The Baptists did it. <laughs> but good for them. And, and uh, you know, that's one of those things I wish I'd have thought of that. Uh, you know, we, we, we should... We should do that. Now, you can't put it on, on public property. So all the people who own property, they put it up there, and, you know, their property is right on the side of the highway, or, you know, hey, I own the property. I'll put what I want over there. You know, well, next they'll say you can't put it on private property, maybe. Size up the situation. Size it up in terms of four things. The creed what we believe, the seven sacraments, the Ten Commandments, and prayer, the four sections of how the church teaches the faith. Well, where are in terms of the creed? Wow, a lot of people don't believe. You know why the world is in the sick, sorry state that it's in? Because of the Catholic Church, because of our miserable failure to be everything we can be. Be all you can be. Wow, that, wasn't that an army commercial? Be all you can be. Well, that's our motto. That's the church. You should be everything you can be. Jesus Christ gave his church to hold the very world in being. And to the degree we are faithful to our mission, the world is held up. To the degree we are unfaithful, and I don't mean the church as a whole. The church is faithful as a whole. The church is indefectibly holy as a whole. Why? Because of us? No, because of him. Jesus is the head of the church. The Holy Spirit is the soul or life-giving force of the church. We are members of the mystical body of Christ. But as the individual members of the mystical body of Christ fail in their mission... 
in a sense, the church is weakened and we're not strong enough to hold the world up anymore. And so what happens? Well, what happens is the world begins to sink into hell under the weight of its own iniquity. And it's our fault. Why? Because we were not what we should have been. We did not live up to our responsibility. Do you understand that less than 20% of Catholics practice their faith in North America? And it's less than that in Europe. That's pretty bad. Well, I have, let's see, four out of my, four out of five soldiers in my company are dead. One out of five is alive and can be assigned a mission. Well, dead, <laughs> dead guys can't perform missions. If you're dead, you're dead. If you're not practicing your faith, going to mass, by the way, missing mass on Sundays without a good reason is a mortal sin. That's a fact. That's a fact. Oh, gosh, don't. Don't give me facts. You'll only confuse me. It's right there in the catechism, and it is a fact. Now, that, I, with, without a good reason. Now, there can be a good reason. You're sick. You're elderly. You can't get to Mass. You know, you have a sick child, and you have to take care of the child. There are good reasons. I mean, you, you can. There, there, it's possible. But you should try not to. Why? Well, if you are in hostile territory, one of the things you have to do is stay healthy. It is much easier to stay healthy than to get cured from being injured or sick. So you want to try to preserve your health, your strength. You can't preserve your strength and your health if you do not have nourishment. That's the Holy Eucharist. Why does the church require us to go to Mass at least once a week on the Lord's Day, on Sundays, and Holy Days of Obligation? We need it. That's why the church doesn't do to take away our freedom or to tell us what to do or push us around. We need it. I, think about it. If you had to walk 100 miles to get out of un enemy territory in rough terrain, swamps, mountains, jungles, deserts, and you had nothing to eat for that time, you would have less of a chance of surviving than if you had nourishment, which helped to keep you strong enough to make progress. Without the Holy Eucharist, you do not have the, 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 the nourishment you need. That's why we have to go to Mass, stay in a state of grace, receive the Holy Eucharist. So size up the situation in, in terms of creed, in terms of sacraments, the situation. Well, you may find yourself in a situation where you're in mortal sin. You're addicted to some sin. You've got some favorite sin. It might be a sexual sin. Now that is one of the enemies, and this is another element of, of this we have to look into because you have to know your enemy. You have to know his weapons and his tactics. Sexual sin, it's huge. Can you imagine if some of the stuff that we see in the media today, and when I say media, I mean movies, television, so forth. Can you imagine in 1954, let's say some of that appeared on your television screen in 1954, they'd lock them up, right? They'd lock them up and throw away the key. Oh, but we've made progress, have we? Is that progress or regress? You know, are we winning or losing? That's an indication the battle is not going well. But we've seemed to take it quite well. You know what? Can you imagine if they insulted Jews or Muslims the way they do Catholics, the world getting away with it, oh, there'd be hell to pay. But we seem to take it quite nicely. 
One thing after the next, they spit in your face and you take it. Well, but they spit in Jesus' face. Well, his hour had come, and if yours comes, you take it too. But that's not what I'm talking about. I'm not talking about physically. I'm talking about standing up for what you know is true, what we believe. So assess the situation. Size up the situation. We have a dismal state of affairs morally in this country. Not just this country, in, in the world, in the, in the whole Western world. You know, you have to be careful. Learn a little bit about history, including the Old Testament. Do you know what happened to God's people when they were unfaithful to him? He handed them over to their enemies. Israel failed to be faithful to the covenant. What happened? He had, God handed them over to the enemy. Watch out that the Christian world doesn't get handed over to the enemy because of its infidelity. One person at a time. Size up the situation. Commandments. Are, are, are we in general? Well, in general, yes, but me in particular, and you in particular. What's my situation with respect to living the moral life? Size it up. Prayer. Size up the situation. What is my life of prayer? Do you have a prayer life? There's 24 hours in a day, seven days in a week. How many hours a day do you watch television? Do you give God at least equal time? How, much, how many minutes do you spend in prayer? Size up the situation. Am I weak or strong in my belief, in my moral life, in my prayer life, in my sacramental life? Size up the situation. That's the first letter in the word survival. S. Size up the situation. You've got to do that for your spiritual survival. Then you undo haste makes waste. Well, in the natural order, in a survival situation, what they're talking about is you, you're, you're, you realize that there you are behind enemy lines. You're caught in a bad situation. You're being hunted by the enemy. Undo haste makes waste. That means don't go running headlong. Oh, I got to escape. I got to escape. So you just try to get out of there. No. Collect your thoughts. Remember your training. Be still and know that I am God. All the noise in a noisy world is part of the enemy's tactic. All the noise, the constant noise, the television, the radio, noise, 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 activity, activity, activity. Families don't even have time to sit down together and have a meal at the end of the day. That is a bad mistake. But, but Junior has soccer practice. You know, Susie has... Uh, dance class or whatever. Well, that, those are good things. I'm not against that. I'm, I'm for that. But the family has to have a certain priority. You must spend time together. Don't be so much in a hurry that you forget basic things. No, don't let your mind be, be so speeded up that it's hard to just sit down and talk to God. You have to spend time every day alone with God. Yeah, oh, you pray with your wife, your husband, your, your children, great, perfect. Pray with your parents, excellent. Spend some time alone with God. If you have to do it early in the morning, do it. That's when I have to do it. Because if I don't do it then, there's a chance I might not do it if I get too busy. And if you're too busy to pray, you're too busy. That's all. You have to be still. Don't be preoccupied with a million things. 
So remember Martha and Mary? Right? Uh, Martha was uh, concerned about all the uh, elements of hospitality, she, the, the cooking, the cleaning, and, 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 and Mary just sat at the feet of the Lord, soaking up his every word. And, and Martha complained, oh, tell Mary to help me. Martha, Martha, people, people, you are anxious and concerned about many things. One thing alone matters. Mary has chosen the better part, and it will not be denied her. Undue haste makes waste. Slow down, slow down in a busy, noisy world. Slow down, be quiet, because the voice of God usually comes as a tiny whisper. As it came to Elijah on the mountain. He was in hostile territory. Remember what happened to Elijah, the prophet? They were hunting him, right? King Ahab and, and, and his pagan wife, Jezebel, they hated Elijah. He was a disturber of the peace. Yeah, he disturbed people's minds because he told them the truth. The king didn't like that, and, and the king's wife liked it even less. I like Elijah, my favorite character from the Old Testament. Remember Elijah? They, 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 they hunted him down. He had to hide, escape an evasion, hiding in caves in the mountains. The army was hunting him. And then God came and spoke to him in a still tiny whisper. And he listened to God. But you can't hear God if there's all that noise going on. So slow down. Get some silence in your life. Even if it's only 15 minutes, that's better than nothing. I also like Elijah. You remember what Elijah did to the false prophets? 450 of them. He took them down. It's it. I'm right. The Bible says it. He took them down to the brook, brook Kidron. 450 of them, and he slit their throats. Now, don't go getting any ideas. <laughs> this is metaphorical, analogical. Undue haste makes waste. R, remember where you are in this acronym on survival. R, remember where you are. The third letter in the word S-U-R, survival. S-U-R, R, remember. Remember where you are. You are on a battlefield. The enemy is not human. The enemy is spiritual. Our, our, our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against fallen angels. You have real enemies, and this is a real war, and there are real consequences of this real war. And the consequences are eternal. Eternal life or eternal death, heaven or hell. I keep coming back to that. Some of my friends in, that, that know about education and how the human mind works say that you have to repeat something 18 times for the human mind to to grasp it once and for all. Well, I, I probably won't repeat anything here 18 times, but it might seem like it. Remember where you are. Battlefield. 21st century battlefield. 21st century warfare, spiritual warfare. You're caught behind enemy lines. You're in a morally toxic environment. Parents. Don't be irresponsible with your children. Do not hand them over to the world to devour. Equip them. Equip them. Teach them. Well, they, they don't want to they don't want to learn. They don't want to know the rosary. Wow. I understand that. But you you know, your dad. Your mom, right? You can you put your battle hat on, it says mom. You know what that spells? M O M? Boss. <laughs> you know that one that D A D? Boss. Don't be a wimp. 
I remember my mother, you know, <laughs> this was the old days, and uh, my mother didn't believe in Dr. Spock or uh, a lot of the the, the, uh, the, the, the contemporary, the, well, they weren't contemporary yet, but they started to be when I was around, I guess, in high school. <clears throat> my mother stopped hitting me with her hand when I was 12. 13, 14, yeah, she didn't do that anymore because it hurt, she hurt her hand. I got to be too big, you know, so my mother wasn't, you know, silly. She, she was five foot four, you know, but she had a black belt in all household implements. <laughs> uh, you know, now I'm not, a, don't somebody accuse me of, you know, fostering uh, child abuse or something. I'm not. You know, I, you know, you don't want, I don't want you to abuse anybody, but use your head. You know, there are times when and you don't necessarily have to use physical means, but you, you can impose discipline. You know, oh, you did this? Wonderful. I hope you like the way your room looks, because it's about the only thing you're going to be seeing for a long time. You know? Or I hope you like manual labor, because <clears throat> you're going to get real familiar with it. I mean, I can't believe some, I, I know... I had to do everything. By the time I was 12, my mother worked. My mother was a registered nurse, had to go to work early in the morning, come home, take care of the house, cook, clean, do everything. We, we started helping real early. We had to, you know, and, and, it, and it's only right. It's only right. Listen, people had to, my grandparents had to leave school when they were 12, 13. Why? They had to work. Now, we've had it pretty good. Now, Listen to what I'm saying, because I'm rarely wrong on these things. I wish I were wrong more often. We've become very fat and lazy, morally speaking, spiritually speaking, socially speaking, culturally speaking. Spoiled, rotten. That's about to be over. Most of us have had our net worth, well, reduced significantly in the last couple of years. I don't have any stocks or bonds or anything, but I have to support myself. I don't get support from the church. I'm not tax exempt, by the way. I don't, uh, I don't uh, claim tax exempt status. I don't accept gifts, donations, charitable contributions. Why not? <laughs> Because if you start taking stuff from the government, the government's going to start requiring things like what you can say and what you can't say. I got warned before the last presidential election, you could, we could take away your tax-exempt status. Yeah, you could if I had one. Why don't you check with the IRS? <laughs> You'll find out I'm a good citizen, paying taxes, lots of them. So, you know, back again to, uh, you know, assess your, your circumstances, size up the situation. I don't trust the government as far as I could throw them. <laughs> size up the situation. Undo haste makes waste. Remember where you are. B, vanquish fear and panic. Okay, I'll tell you what. If you don't think we're in a fix, you're not thinking straight. We are in the worst situation of my lifetime. Economically, we, we, we're bankrupt. Do you, do you know that? The United States of America is bankrupt. And China holds the debt. That'll help you sleep at night. <laughs> We're bankrupt and getting worse by the day. We are technically insolvent. But if you ran your household like the United States government runs it, it's, you'd be declaring bankruptcy immediately. 
You'd have to. If you were spending a thousand times more than you have, what would happen to you? Well, what, what should happen to you? The consequences of stupidity aren't good. In plain English, you do dumb things, bad things happen. Well, but vanquish fear and panic. Okay, we're in a bad spot. Seems like the devil's winning. Seems like. But just remember this. See this book? It says Holy Bible on there. We know the last chapter. We win. That's all. We win. Now, yes, you look at the situation, and, and if you like me, now I'm not a political commentator, and I don't want to be a political commentator. That, that's not my job. I know that. Uh, however, uh, if I were to bury my head in the sand and pretend there isn't a problem, I'm a moral commentator and need to be. Heck, have they done, can they do anything right? I mean, think about it. Think about it. The last couple of years, think about it. Can they do anything right? I don't know. I'm, I'm wondering. It's, it's almost like, are they doing it on purpose? <laughs> are they truly dumb or truly evil? You know, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm, just, I'm just asking the question. Nonetheless, vanquish fear and panic. Okay, that, that's what the Army Survival Manual says with respect to survival in a bad situation. You're behind enemy lines. Vanquish fear and panic. Because if you panic, you're dead meat. There's still a God in heaven. He's not dead. He's not even sick. There's still a God in heaven. Fear is useless. What is needed is trust. Aha. That's what Jesus says in the gospel. Fear is useless. What is needed is trust. Therefore, trust in the Lord. You know the divine mercy chaplet, right? You know the picture of Jesus and the divine mercy? What does it say right at the bottom of the picture? Yeah, Jesus, I trust in you. Exercise trust. When you are, are, you're tempted to be fearful for your children, your grandchildren, your country, your parish. I understand that. I wake up in the middle of the night frequently scared to death, scared of a hundred things. Uh, I, I, I'm perspiring profusely. Oh, Lord, now what? Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Well, you're, you, you're gonna, you've got a heart condition, you're going to die. Jesus, I trust in you. Don't panic. Don't panic. You've got cancer. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. Your country, which you love and ought to, which perhaps you went off to World War II or Korea or Vietnam because you espouse the principles upon which this country is built, and you see what's happening, the temptation can be, be fearful, panic. Don't. Jesus, I trust in you. So that's the fourth, the B, the fourth letter in the word. Survival, vanquish, fear, and panic. I improvise. You know, you've assessed the situation. You know what's going on. You've got to improvise. But, but they have a horrible, they don't have a good catechetical program in my parish, in the diocese. In the, the, stop. Improvise. Do you know who the, num the first responsibility for catechesis is? Not with the diocese or the parish. It's the parents. Improvise. You know, I, I mentioned it before. If you... Take my series on the Catechism of the Catholic Church and go through it. I promise you, you will know your faith. It's that simple. I didn't read, I just took the book. I didn't have to like make it up or something. And I synthesized the book. That's all. I, talk, I, said, I talked about it in, in understandable terms. Learn your faith, you know, and then improvise. Oh, well, they won't teach me the faith. Look, 
A long time ago, a good bishop said to me, I worked for this bishop for a while. Matter of fact, he was the bishop who asked me to do the catechism series, and I did it for his diocese. But he told me something. He said, and, and this isn't always true, but he said, you've got to adapt and improvise. That's what the Marines say, adapt and improvise. Uh, he said, you've got to do that. Don't try to go through the diocesan channels. That's what the bishop told me. Well, it doesn't mean be disobedient. That's not what it means. But what he was saying was if you try to go through formal channels, there are a lot of people who won't want to be associated with what you're doing, even though it's good. They're not going to give you formal approval. Therefore, you, you don't want to disobey. But, you know, the bishop said unconventional warfare. That would be me. <laughs> Un unconventional warfare. See, everything I, almost everything I've done for almost 20 years is unconventional warfare. I do not operate in disobedience. I'm obedient. But they don't tell me, do this and do this and do this and do this. I do it. Like General Colin Powell says, you don't know what you can get away with till you try it. <laughs> well, it doesn't mean do goofy things. And it doesn't mean be disobedient. But it means sometimes you have to improvise. You have to adapt to the situation. Use your head. Teach the faith, but you can't teach it if you don't know it. Improvise. V, value living. Yeah, big thing in, in survival. You've got to value living. You have to fight for your life. Spiritual survival. Fight for your moral and spiritual life. Don't just go with the flow. As Archbishop Fulton Sheen used to say, don't go with the flow, the tenor of the times. Dead bodies float downstream. Dead souls float downstream. It takes live bodies and live souls to resist the currents of the time. There's a tidal wave of hell sweeping all across the earth. You don't have to go with the flow. Resist the currents of the times. Value living. Have the will to live. That means have the will to stay in a state of grace. That means resist temptation, which wants to take you out. Value living. A, act like the natives, it says in the survival acronym. Act like the natives. Well, for our purposes, you know, what it means in the survival manual is if you're in the jungles of Brazil... Learn, learn what, what the natives do, you know, what they eat, how they hunt, what kind of plants they eat, and, you know, how they, how they live, because they've adapted to their surroundings, and they know. Well, for our purposes in spiritual survival, the natives are the saints. They know how to live. They know how, they've, they adapted perfectly to a, an inhospitable climate, which is what the world is, morally and spiritually. The saints know. So you ought to know about the lives of the saints. Hmm? Act like the saints. It doesn't mean you have to do exactly what the saints did, but they taught us principles that are applicable anytime, any place. That's the native. They, they know how to live in order to survive. That, that's what the, the essence of this means, act like the native. Well, why? Because they know how to survive in their, in their environment. Act like the saints who knew how to survive in this world filled with temptations, snares, traps. But how are you going to act like the saints if you don't know how they live? You know, so study. You know, one of the first things I did before I went to the seminary was I systematically studied on my own. I adapted and improvised 500 lives of the saints. I read them, meditated about, uh, on them, prayed to them. And then you begin to interiorize. You learn from them. And then you know how to survive in that environment because they were the ones who survived best, spiritually and morally speaking. And then L, the, five, the last letter in that word survival, L, learn basic skills. You know, you have to learn basic survival skills if you're going to survive in a survival situation. Same thing spiritually Learn your faith. 
learn the moral teaching of the church, learn the sacramental life of the church, learn how to pray, and then most of all, do all of the above. And there you have it, the survival acronym. Do those things and you will have a much better chance of surviving. You'll make it. And when you make it, one day, and, I, and it'll be a day soon, if you live another hundred years, that's soon. In the context of eternity, where 10 billion years is less than a second, you'll hear those beautiful words, having come out into friendly territory. Well done, my good and faithful servant. You made it. Now at last, enter into the joy of your master's house. God bless you.